serve you as mayor of the greatest city in the world, Gaithersburg, Maryland, and also founder and chair of the Gaithersburg Book Festival. As protests continue and we collectively write another chapter uh, in the record of America's struggle with race relations, the GBF team and I have put together this special program because we believe that stories from diverse voices can foster understanding, open minds, and ultimately change our world. The fact is, in difficult times, people often turn to books. Books give us perspective. They breed empathy. They give us tools we can use to better understand the world. And oftentimes, they give us hope. Today is no different. Since our city has built such a culture around books and authors over the last decade, we felt compelled to tap into our GBF connections in order to add a constructive voice to our, our national conversation on race and the need for change. It is in that spirit that we offer tonight's program. I'm so happy that members of our city council are here with me to uh, introduce our distinguished author panel. Take it away, council members. Good evening. I have the pleasure of introducing Donnell Clayton. She is the author of four novels, including the Bell series. A former elementary and middle school librarian, Danielle earned a master's in fine arts and creative writing from the new school, co-founded Cake Literary, a media and content company dedicated to diverse fiction and currently serves as chief operating officer of We Need Diverse Books. Adam Gidwitz is the author of the Newbery Honor winning The Inquisitor's Tale, the best-selling Grimm trilogy and the Unicorn Rescue Society series for which he has teamed up with the other authors from the cultures that the series visits. In his writing, Gidwitz hopes to lead children to a deeper, more emotionally connected and integrated understanding of the world. Anna Khan is the author of 11 books for children and young adults, including Amina's Voice, which was named a best book of 2017 by the Washington Post, NPR, Kirkus Reviews and others. Khan, a proud native of Rockville, Maryland, is a frequent guest at schools where she talks about writing and books and her experiences as an American Muslim. And our moderator tonight is Wade Hudson, whose career as a writer spans more than three decades. Wade has written and published more than 25 books for young people, the most recent being a star-studded anthology, We Rise, We Resist, We Raise Our Voices. Hudson's passion for writing and a lifelong mission to help foster positive self-image within the Black community prompt him, prompted him and his wife, Cheryl, to launch Just Us Books, the nation's leading independent publisher of Black interest books for young people. One last note to our viewers, please post your questions in the live chat and we'll try to get to all of them before the end of the program. And now, uh, welcome to all of our authors. I'll turn it over to our moderator, Wade Hudson. Thank you, Mayor Judd, and uh, I'd like to thank you and Carolyn Crosby and all those responsible for uh, organizing this panel. And I'm just so happy to have an opportunity to engage with uh, a few of my friends, uh, those who, like me, create books for young people uh, to read. Um, now, the topic of uh, this panel is how diverse stories can open minds and change the world. To say that it's a timely uh, topic is a gross understatement. It speaks in a profound way to where we are today. The topic asserts that diverse stories, stories that include all people in our variety, can open minds and thereby change the world. Now, if that is true, then the opposite is perhaps true as well. The lack of diverse stories can keep minds closed, lead to a distorted, marginalized view of others and the world. In our often quoted and referenced paper, Windows, Mirrors, and Sliding Glass Doors, published in the summer of 1990 in the volume of Perspectives, Choosing and Using Books for the Classroom, Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop wrote, children from dominant social groups have always found their mirrors in books, but they too have suffered from the lack of availability of books about others. They need the books as windows into reality, not just an imaginary world. 
They need books that will help them understand the multicultural nature of the world they live in and their place as a member of just one group, as well as their connections to all other humans. She continued, in this country where racism is still one of the major unresolved social problems, books may be one of the few places where children who are socially isolated and insulated from the larger world may meet people unlike themselves. If they see only reflections of themselves, they will grow up with an exaggerated sense of their own importance and value in the world, a dangerous ethnocentrism. I would like to start our uh, discussion um, by asking our panelists, what kind of books did you have when you were growing up that uh, influenced you and perhaps even helped to shape uh, how you view the world? And we'll start with Helen. What, what kind of books did you, did you have to read when you were growing up? So thank you. Thank you for that question. Thank you um, to everyone for inviting me to this panel. Um, I, I was a big reader as a kid. I spent a lot of time at the library. My mom was a big pusher of literacy and she led nothing more than to see her kids with faces in a book. So that's what I did in a lot of my free time. Um, but I think as, you know, as I was going through the shelves and finding my favorites, I tended to gravitate towards stories that featured families. And I think I was very curious as a child of immigrants being raised as a Pakistani American Muslim, how other people lived um, and wanting you know, to get to know other families. And I was a big fan of Beverly Cleary and Ramona Quimby, Judy Bloom. I loved Little Women. I think I was searching for myself in stories without finding myself. And to what you were speaking about Dr. Dr. Bishop's um, analysis, I was one of the people who was, you know, non-dominant and maybe suffered from not seeing myself and having in, in the converse, not an exaggerated sense of self, but the sense of my stories not mattering. Uh, and not until much later in life realized that the absence of seeing myself in stories really did shape the way I, I saw the value of my own existence uh, in, in many ways and um, something I'd love to talk about further with all of you. Yeah, how, how did not seeing yourself reflected in the books that you had to read uh, affected you and influenced you? Yeah, so I didn't realize it when I was a kid. And people ask me now, because I am writing stories with characters that do reflect my, my background, you know, how did it make you feel? And did you feel sad or did you feel left out? And the truth is that I wasn't aware of it as a kid. But it was only later on looking back and actually finding some of my own writing from when I was a child. I used to write a family newspaper where I talked about what was happening at home. And I discovered these issues and I went back and read them and found that I left out all the details that made my family different from Ramona Quimby or other characters I was reading about. And how if someone else looked at my family newspaper, they might have thought that I was you know, part of a white American family. Um, and that was very jarring for me to go back and read that and see that I, censored myself in a way and took out the things that made me different. And, and that was eye-opening that why, why didn't I feel like I had the permission to include things that were so prevalent in my day-to-day -day life, like a different language, a different culture, you know, clothing, food, religion, all the things that were very, very much part of an identity that I just left out. What about you, Adam? What, what, uh, what did you read when you were growing up? Um, yeah, well, I certainly heard myself in Dr. Bishop's, uh, the quote that you just read, for sure. I have heard myself in the in the white dominant uh, narrative. And it's the truth. I mean, I read Roald Dahl and I read um, Jerry Spinelli, Maniac McGee, and I loved those books and I did. And I feel, you know, I think I felt like they were books about me. And one of the difficulties, one of the problems, you know, a lot of racism and the racist systems that oppress people of color in this country as we should. And I think another element of the conversation that should also be heard about and acknowledged is the way that the white supremacist system that we live in that, that has a lot of white books around, right? Just as an example, hurts white people also, maybe not as much, but is also not good for us. And so when we get into a situation where we see, for example, people on the street saying, this is not how you should be treating your black fellow citizens one of the first reactions is often, well, hold on. Now you're making me uncomfortable. I didn't feel uncomfortable before centering our own experience. And that's what I learned from reading the books that I read growing up, as good as they are. I'm not, I, everyone should read Matilda. It's one of the greatest books ever written in my opinion. 
But that said, if it's all that you're reading, it becomes really easy to center yourself in your own experience. Um, and then that certainly gets deep, deep into your brain. And trying to work that out now is going to be a long process. So when you were growing up, were you around uh, people of color? Did you have people of color in your, uh, your environment? And, I mean, if, and if not, you know, having not been prepared, how did you uh, sort of address accepting other people if they weren't not in your environment or even in the books that you had to read? That's a deep, difficult question. So I grew up in uh, not too far from Gaithersburg in Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Baltimore, Maryland is a, is a majority black city. And I grew up in a white enclave in a majority black city. And so from very early on, I was very aware, not only that there were multiple races, many races, um, but that they were kept apart and that they were treated differently. I lived in a neighborhood, I won't go on too long because a lot, I want to hear Danielle speak and everybody speak, but I lived in a neighborhood where it was bordered on what was a white neighborhood, as I said. And in fact, when my parents moved into the house that we lived in, there was a little bit in the covenant that said, you shall not sell this house to blacks or Jews. Mm. My parents being Jewish said, um, is this a problem? And they said, oh no, don't worry about it. But there weren't any black people living in my neighborhood. Right. Mm -hmm. And right on the edge of the neighborhood was a black community just next door. And the neighborhood had created all one way streets going out into that black neighborhood. So that if you wanted to come from York Avenue around into my neighborhood, you had to go all the way around. So, you know, starting fairly young, I started to be quite aware of the discrepancies and the differences. Um, but then how to cope with that. I was not helped by literature. I was not, there was great literature when I was growing up that could have helped me, not enough, much more now. Um, but it was mostly friends. I made a very, very close uh, African-American friend who, you know, uh, his family was from inner city Baltimore and we were still very close and he had to teach me a lot. And I know that's a big burden on him. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it's, which is not a fair burden to put on anybody. So anyway, um, uh, yeah, it's a long process and it continues. Right. Danielle, what about you? Well, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit, um, Mr. Hudson, because, <laughs> and I know you don't like it when I call you that, but I have to, because <laughs> I don't think that I would have the imagination and the stories that I have without you and your beautiful, wonderful wife and Just Us Books. What you did for me and for people who look like me is reaffirm all of the wonderful things in my family and my home in story. And so I did get to grow up reading all things Virginia Hamilton and all things Walter Dean Myers. And I think that the Black American community was able to have some books that celebrated us and we create our own cultural fabric to make sure that our children have what they need. And I felt like I got a great fill of wonderful books, partly because of the work that you were doing to make sure that all kids who look like me had something to celebrate about that in our culture. So I was gonna get you a little bit at the start of this. <laughs> um, but um, I was blessed. I got a lot of great role models in books from, um, from the books that you put out and also Mildred Taylor. And also I was reading all the books that Hannah and Adam brought up and Babysitter's Club and Judy Bloom and all of those things. And I think I was searching for mischief and magic and to be the hero and these huge big stories that all of my classmates were reading because what I did notice was in schools, I'm a male learner too, I grew up in Gaithersburg, I'm here in Gaithersburg right now, born and raised. Not all the kids were given the books that with characters who look like me. I'm the only black kid in class, so the teacher thought she was doing a great job by handing me that book. And I was reading all of those books and the ones that my white classmates were reading, but I found out quickly that it didn't always go both ways in terms of who read about who. And so that was a very interesting experience from my childhood watching that. So, um, so here you are reading uh, these wonderful uh, books about the black experience and your classmates, I'm assuming mostly white, are not reading uh, these books. So what kind of impact did that have on you in terms of how you saw yourself and even how you uh, fit in within uh, the group? it made me feel like black stories and stories about black families and black children were put in silos, like their own little neighborhoods, like Adam was talking about. And only us, we only, we were supposed to read those books. And those were, um, they were segregated. 
And I felt like stories about us were given a particular lane and lens and they weren't taught in school and they weren't, um, we all didn't get to read it. Instead, if we wanted to read something that had black characters in it, we would get to kill a mockingbird. So, and that would be, it's the check check of, you know, oh, here are some black people in this book, no matter the white savior trope in that book. So it really affected me to, to try to figure out how do I write books or how do I engage with books that have, that everyone should be reading. Everyone deserves to be the hero of the story. But what happens when the educational market dovetails and silos books with characters that look like you into little pockets of teachable lessons, or that's just for certain kids and not for all children. And so it just made me angry and it fueled all of the work that I currently do, <laughs> which I know we're gonna get into. <laughs> and we're grateful for, so sorry you were angry, but we're glad, thank you for your work. <laughs> Judy Bloom said that those of us who write do it because there are stories inside of us burning to get out. Writing is essential to our way of being. And James Baldwin said, you write in order to change the world. If you author, even by a millimeter, the way people look at reality, then you can change it, meaning the world. Why do you write? And the follow-up question to that is, uh, why do you write for young readers, Hannah? Yeah, well, a beautiful sentiment. Um, I, I didn't feel like I had stories inside me that I was burning to tell, to be honest. Um, I, I never thought that I had stories that were worth sharing or that I had lived enough or that I was important enough. And so my initial interest in writing was to be a journalist, uh, to tell other people's stories uh, and to you know report on news. and maybe stems back to my having a family newspaper as a kid or whatever it is, but I, I didn't consider myself a storyteller for a very long time. Uh, and it was sort of by accident that I went on that path to writing for children. Um, but it was really becoming a mother that made me want to write for children and made me want to write stories about children like mine. Um, my son, my older son, my firstborn was six months old on September 11th, 2001. And at that time, I really saw the power of narrative, you know, come to life in front of me and a lot of the confusion and uncertainty around the Muslim community. And I wanted to do something like anything I could to try to help my kid feel proud of who he was. And that was, there was this, I felt the shift and this fear among the American Muslim community that our kids were going to ra be raised or grow up feeling very, very different than we had. Um, and so for me, it was about, you know, doing anything I could to try to make him feel better accepted, better understood, and um, more confident, definitely, than I was as, as a kid. So that was, I think, what propelled me into thinking about writing books for kids. So how did you get your start in the industry? So I have a dear friend from elementary school, and I also grew up in Maryland, uh, in Rockville, Maryland, not far from Gaithersburg, and one of my best friends, I know, we're the <laughs> and um one of my very best friends from elementary school was working for Scholastic Book Clubs. And she invited me, remembering that I was a writer we'd written together in school. We worked together on our high school newspaper. Um, she asked me to help her out with a series called Spy University. And that's when I first started connecting with writing for kids, something I wasn't accustomed to doing and didn't really think I could do. And I realized how much you know, I love doing it. I love being back in the mindset of a kid. I loved thinking about how much books meant to me and the impact they had on me as a kid and getting that first piece of fan mail just sort of sealed it. <laughs> I thought like, this is what I want to do forever as long as somebody will let me. So it was really um, a, just a lucky combination of events that brought me here. Danielle, I know you've been a teacher and also a librarian. So why did you become a writer? I mean, you, you've been a teacher as well, but Danielle, why did you become a writer? Well, I failed chemistry in college. So my parents said that I better figure it out um, and figure it out fast. So um, I was so sort of sad going down south away from home. I'm very spoiled. And I just started rereading the things that I loved as a child. That was Harriet the Spy. That was all of Mildred Taylor and so on and so forth. And I realized there was so much love and joy in children's books. And so I thought I was just going to be a teacher and a librarian. And then I had to take, um, I was getting my master's in children's literature and I had to take a writing class. It was pain and torturous. I never thought I would write. 
I thought I would always just be a book bully, a really small tyrant with thick glasses telling someone what to read, right? I still plan to be this person. Um, and then I realized after studying the canon of children's literature that there are so many children missing. And I thought how unfair that was and how frustrating it was. And what would my imagination be like as a writer? Would I have grown a bigger imagination had I encountered myself in different versions as a child, as a young reader, growing that imagination. And so I got busy. Um, I started trying to write the types of stories that I wanted to see, especially black children in fun stories, ones where they're the heroes and save the world, adventures, love stories, drama. And I was working at schools in East Harlem and my kids were like, I just want drama. I just want like, where are the witches? I want magic. I want, you know, where's the things that blow up and explode, right? And I didn't have anything for those children to read. I only had things that were serious and sad. And I wanted to also try to find a way to send the elevator back down. How do I get more folks into publishing and teach them how to do this? and blow open the door so we can add more seats to the table. So I really came at this from a very different place. It's really about making sure that children have a variety of things to read and showing through, sh through me writing. This is what I mean when I say joyful, high concept, fun stories that are not about the burden of brownness and, the, and don't press on the bruises of black America, but rather explore mischief and magic and love. Um, and our high concept because we need both. But I wanted to do, I wanted to write the other things. Right, yeah. What about you, Adam? Why did you be, become a writer? You were a teacher also, right? I think you taught in Brooklyn, I believe. Sorry, I muted myself. Now you can hear me, right? Yep. Yes, I did. I was a teacher. Um, I taught in Brooklyn. Um, and I was, I, I also did not plan to be a writer. Um, and I was teaching and I realized I was not very good at teaching. The only way that I could get my kids to be quiet um, was to tell them stories. That was the only thing I could do to get them to shut their mouths for five minutes and listen to me. So I was just, I was telling stories constantly all the time. And I realized that that was something that I was really good at. And I had gotten a lot of practice as a kid. I was always the kid at the lunch table who was lying over lunch, you know, like, oh, I did this thing over the weekend and it wasn't true. And they would always know it was so fiction is really was my calling. I just didn't realize it. So I started telling stories to kids and eventually I started to write them down. Um, but I think the reason that I stuck with it, in addition to, you know, um, uh, enjoying scaring kids, making them laugh, writing gives me a chance to wrestle with the problems that I find the thorniest, the most difficult. And, and I think, you know, and I, I know everyone on this call agrees, and I hope everyone watching does too. I believe children are at least as smart as adults, if not smarter. And you can, you can ask the hardest questions to kids. Um, and you just have to, uh, you put it in slightly different language or you don't assume as much background knowledge, which is often better because you have to get at the heart of it. So especially these days when there is so much rethinking of our world that needs to happen from a racial perspective, from a fairness perspective, from an environmental perspective, from a political perspective, writing books gives me a chance to, from a, from a uh, gender and, and sex perspective, Writing books gives me a chance to wrestle with the things that I thought I knew and am realizing that I don't. And then to pose those questions again to my kid readers without knowing what the answers are going to be. And at the end of the book, maybe I think I have an answer or maybe I don't. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm asking them the question too. and We're, we're going to wrestle with it together. When I was teaching, I always had this thing that I tried to do. I called it serious fun. We were seriously we were going to have a lot of fun while we took on serious problems. And, and that's, that's what I bring when I, what I try to bring when I'm writing. That's why it's still interesting. So how did you get your first book published? Oh, I got lucky. And this is honestly, I mean, this is partially um, lucky. I got lucky on like a deep, deep level. Talk about privilege. <laughs> so <laughs> I was teaching at a predominantly white pri uh, private school in Brooklyn Heights. And I was telling you stories. And uh, it happened that one of the parents at that school was a literary agent. And I asked her if I could have some advice about writing books for kids. And she said, why don't you show me your book? And she read the book, took it to an editor, and, and it went from there. Um, and I mean, first of all, I was teaching at a rarefied white school 
in a very diverse city in a very diverse borough and a place where there was a lot of privilege around. Um, but I was even able to teach there. I mean, they didn't pay anything. They didn't pay enough to live on. Mm -hmm. And I was able to teach there because we had family money that was going to float me for the time being. Yeah. Um, and, and we can talk about where that came from that because that family money also came from a history of, of racism in this country. Mm -hmm. So I, I got a lot of lucky breaks, um, but they go way back into the 1880s. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and that's how I got here. And then, you know, thinking and, and trusting kids too. You got to do both. Right. What about you, Danielle? How did you get your first book published? Oh boy, I'm a very stubborn uh, person and I wrote eight different books and I wouldn't stop um, from start to finish. And I got several, you know, I just, I would stay up till two or three o'clock in the morning. I had four jobs. I was living in New York City, like not trying to ask dad for money or have to move back to Gaithersburg. <laughs> so I was determined. And what happened was actually um, sort of like Adam, I was tutoring a kid and that kid happened to be the child of a very, very important um, black editor named Andrea Davis Pinckney. And I got to have her as my mentor and talk to her about breaking into the industry. But I still had to write a book and I still, she is an exacting mentor. I still had to um, write and write and write and keep trying. And I actually, while I was getting my MFA at the new school, because I come from a family where if you want to do something, you need to make sure that you're educated in that thing so that people don't deny you. That's sort of the cloth that I was raised in. I met um, my writing partner, Sona Charapatra, and we were talking about how we were having trouble finding stories that reflected the type of diversity we wanted to see. She is Indian American and Punjabi specifically and Hindu, and she was did not see Indian characters depicted in a positive light in children's books. So we decided to think about how can we put together stories for children in a different way to teach the industry that there are other ways to do this work. So we launched a company called Cake Literary, where we believe that making a book is like making a cake. And if it came in one flavor, if cake came in one flavor for your whole life, it'd be really boring. So it has really good diversity. And we package books and put them together and give writers opportunities like training wheels through the process to open up the door and get them book deals. And so we wrote together to say, hey, this is what we mean. We wrote a book together called Tiny Pretty Things. We wrote it from page one, five times, got so many rejections, had to go through one, two agents. Um, and just to say, hey, this is a book about ballet, but it also follows three very diverse characters. It's still a book about ballet and those diverse backgrounds determine how they are treated in this world. My first job outside of college was at a ballet school in DC. And um, that's how I got my first job, my first gig and broke through the industry. But it took me eight manuscripts, two agents, thousands of queries, lots of stubbornness. Um, but I'm, my dad calls me bossy, but he says it's leadership skills. And uh, <laughs> that is how I broke in. Lots of perseverance, lots of rewriting. Writing is rewriting. So I just kept pushing. Yeah. And it debuts on Netflix this fall. So oh, wow. congratulations. Yeah. congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, the late uh, black writer, Walter Dean Myers, who was a mentor to so many, so many writers once said, it is this language of values, which I hope to bring to my books. I want to bring values to those who have not uh, been valued. And I want to etch those values in terms of the ideal. Young people need ideals which identify them and their lives as central. Guideposts which tell them what they can be, should be, and indeed are. What do you hope to accomplish with the books that you write? Uh, Hannah, you wanna? Sure. Take a shot at it. <laughs> well, exactly what he said. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's it really. Um, I want kids like mine to of course feel validated and included and for, their experiences to mean something and, and feel just as important as anyone else's. But on the same, at the same time, I want kids who are different than mine to see little brown Muslim kids as the heroes in stories like Danielle's talking about. Um, stories that, they, you know, where they feel um, 
they want to be that person, you know, or want to be part of their family or wish that they were on that adventure or journey. Um, just like I did when I was reading about other characters, you know, I, I wish I was doing some of those things or living in that house or whatever it was. And, um, and I, you know, I, I, it's one of those things that I know we've all heard so much in terms of who, who are we writing for? And I know again and again, writers like me who are saying, well, I'm writing for everybody. You know, I want everyone to read these books and it, you know, I can't say which is more important than the other because um, I think it's so important for people of all backgrounds to see kids like mine as the hero, you know, and as somebody positive and with a, a loving family that um, seems very natural and, and, and relatable and comfortable. And for it to sort of feel like I like books as, you know, warm blankets and, and you know, hugs and I like writing about positive things. And I feel like all kids deserve that. And uh, that, that's really what I, what I hope to accomplish. Adam, in many of your books, um, readers are able to take a magical journey, exciting um, and uh, go places where the imagination can can take them. Uh, so what, what do you hope to accomplish by writing these kinds of books? Yeah, um, I think that, um, you know, I've kind of got two categories of books, so they do overlap. I've got, you know, my first three books are fa fa fairy tale based books. Mm -hmm. And I've got this historical fiction in the middle, the, the uh, Inquisitor's Tale. And now I've got the series, the Unicorn Rescue Society, um, which is sort of a traveling series about two kids who traveled around the world rescuing mythical creatures from danger. So yes, all three types of books have dragons in it. My editor once asked, are you ever gonna write a book without dragons? And I said, why, why would I do that? Um, but um, they do have different kinds of, of goals. So the fairy tale books are very much about, you know, I believe that the fairy tale is about investigating your subconscious. You know, my first book, A Tale Dark and Grim is scary and weird and kind of bloody. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, but it also came out of the emotions that I had when my parents got divorced. And so it's about exploring those kinds of feelings, even though the word divorce is never in the book, no parents get divorced, never says it, but it's about going in, in interior. And the Inquisitor's Tale is about living in a world that is um, uh, diverse and it's, it takes place in the middle ages, which people don't normally think of as diverse and yet it was. And so it's about how they encounter other people, the other, and, uh, and each of them is an other in a sense. And now the Unicorn Rescue Society is about these two kids who travel around the world rescuing mythical creatures from danger. And this is about going to different places and, and learning the mythology, the culture, the lore, the language, um, and being enriched by it. Um, so one of the books I read growing up, one of the series I read growing up were the Tintin books. Now Tintin these days, people have realized has like a whole host of problems from the, you know, the French book that was never published in English, which is just straight out awfully racist mm -hmm. to Tintin's much later books where the author Hergé um, had become sort of in, more enlightened in his mind for his day and yet still centered white experience and everybody else was lesser than. So the Unicorn Rescue Society tries to be the opposite and I'm very lucky that the most recent writer, the newest writer in the Unicorn Rescue Society is Hannah Kahn. She yeah. is right. We have, we have just finished the first draft of the sixth book of the series um, uh, called The Secret of the Himalayas right now. And it takes place in Pakistan. And, and the point of, of this series is to have a fun, exciting adventure, just like Danielle said, which is so important, right? That like, we're having a great time while we read this book, but we're also, you know, hopefully dismantling stereotypes without ever mentioning the stereotypes about this place and these and this culture. We are seeing it as a rich and exciting and be beautiful place that it is um, at the same time and, and through an authentic voice and a brilliant writer like Hannah. So I'm, I don't know, Hannah, maybe you want to say something about that or not, but um, I don't want to speak for you. <laughs> speak to my brilliance. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's brilliant and she won't tell you that, but I will. <laughs> no, you're too kind. Um, I love that you mentioned without mentioning the stereotypes. And I think that is such a um, important thing that I've actually learned through some work with a nonprofit think tank and research organization when in even trying to combat um, stereotypes or prejudices or biases that people have. And a lot of times our tendency is to say, well, it's not this, you know, and, and in a way that I was taught through this um, media training that you you shouldn't say it. Don't say um, 
you know, Muslim women are X, Y, aren't X, Y, Z, they are blah, blah, blah. Just say what they are. Um, because even just by bringing up the stereotype to refute it, you are reinforcing that idea. And sometimes that's what people walk away with. And I thought that is something I, it's not intuitive to me. I would think you have to just defend. And I love that you mentioned that because I think that's what these stories have the potential to do is that they're dismantling things that people may think without them even realizing it. Um, and, and I think that's the beauty of, of great storytelling and, and having the power to do that. Um, and, and of course, not in a didactic way at all. It's just while they're being super entertained, but it's like, wow, I, I, I didn't realize that people in this part of the world were cool in this way or whatever it is. So I loved it. It was such a fun experience. So Danielle, what do you what do you hope to accomplish? I hope to accomplish two things. Um, when I get at this question, I think um, about the books, but I also think about the authors behind the books. I want children to see me. I want them to know that a black woman created this thing that they love and that they too can create that because I truly believe you can't be what you can't see. And if I had known that there were more black authors being able to live a life of creating story, I wouldn't have gone down the doctor road. If I had known, if I had been introduced to Octavia Butler before I was a grown up, I would know that I could write fantasy and that I could imagine fantastical landscapes full of black people and families that look like mine and make a, make a living out of it. But I didn't know that. And that's because I wasn't given that opportunity to know. And there's something about um, what a content creator leaves behind in their work. And for me, I want to leave breadcrumbs behind in my work that the children I'm speaking to pick up. So I leave my little codes behind of these little loving breadcrumbs so that black children who read my work feel loved and feel like my beloveds and that all other children who engage with my work feel excited and loving and wanting to be a part of my universe. I want them always to be looking for a door into my world that I built. And it, it's been built out of the bones and the dust and the love of where I come from, which is rural Mississippi, right? And my people. And I want that to leave that behind. So it's twofold for me because I do think it's important that content creators of color and marginalized content creators get to be to tell their own stories and get to be seen by children so that they know. Then Henna wouldn't have been writing the things that she was writing as a kid because she would have seen a beautiful Pakistani person writing books and being like, I can do that. And I can write about my family and my food and my culture and yes, that this is okay. I've seen her, she's come to my school. I see that in the, it's in the cadence and the rhythm of the language in the book. It's the way that parents talk to children. It's the things that they're afraid of. When you write from truth, the truth of your background, you leave those breadcrumbs behind for the kids who need them. And you also invite others to eat. And that I think is my most important goal with all the work that I do and with all of my books. So how do you decide what you're going to write about uh, the subject of, uh, of a book? Um, Hannah, what, how, do you, how do you select your topics? Yeah, so I think when I first started, it sort of evolved over, over the last how many years I've been doing this. It's been a long time now. But when I first started, I, I was very aware of being one of the only mainstream published Muslim authors out there. And so I felt like I was very specifically filling um, gaps that existed. And I was like, we don't have a book about Ramadan that presents it from a child's perspective that's not overly instructive, but just the joy of the holiday um, so that people can also learn about what this month means to the Muslim community. Um, so it, was, it went from being that calculated. And in fact, I still write books for that purpose. Like I, you know, last year I had a book called Under My Hijab, publish a picture book, which was to celebrate Muslim women and girls who wear the hijab. Um, so realizing that, you know, there aren't enough books with positive rep with women wearing hijab in it and then trying to fill that. Um, but then now, you know, I feel so fortunate to move beyond that to be able to just tell the stories that come from inside me and are part of my experience either or blending of my experience and my children and, and being able to create stories around a kid who, you know, a little Pakistani kid who's scrawny and, and wants to play basketball or a shy girl who loves to sing or, or books inspired by my favorites and, and others. So uh, it's definitely been an evolution, but I'm very conscious of who I'm writing for when I, when I write. I do think my audience is always um, in the back of my mind. And um, I know some writers just write 
to write, you know, and to, but for me, it's always very much who am I writing for and what, how is this going to be received and what might people feel when they, when they read this. Adam, I, I would think that you would have to do a lot of research for the books that you write. So how do you, how do you select the, the topic or the subject that you want to write about? Unmute. In the, sorry. In the case of um, uh, the Unicorn Rescue Society, um, I actually have been just choosing authors that I really love and respect, like Hannah, and saying, you know, would you like to write about your background and, and what, let's talk about the creatures that we could write about. So Unicorn Rescue Society, Hannah does the really hard work. And then I just get to make sure that the jokes sound like Anna, Elliot and Uchenna. Um, but, um, uh, I, you know, I have been, again, so lucky as a white male writer, I have the freedom to write about anything I want to. Um, I could write about my experience. I can write about somebody else's experience. It doesn't matter. And they'll accept it, especially once I got published. Anything I want to do. Um, and that is not a freedom that is afford, um, afforded to most writers, uh, especially writers of color. Um, so I, you know, uh, without using any names, I there was a recent example that was private about an author who had written a book that was from um, her culture's perspective, her first book. She came back with a second book that was not about racial issues. It was also from the perspective of somebody from her background, but it was not about the same issues. And, and the publisher said to her, we're only interested in, in, in the first subject that you wrote about. So come back to us with that, right? So what Danielle is doing, right? Of opening up, and I'm not just flattering you, it's true. I mean, what you're doing to open up all um, genres, all subjects to anyone, right? That we should all be able to write about those things is um, just incredibly important and will make our books so much better, right? I, if I'm only reading fantasy by white people, then my fantasy is, is poor, right? It's, it's too meager, it's too thin, um, just as an example. So, so yeah, I've been able to choose, choose the books that I wanna uh, write about. And I'm also becoming more aware, as I think we all are, about which books I shouldn't write, right? right? We all feel, you know, um, as white people, we often feel like, as I've said before, my experience is centered. If I feel like I want to do this, I should be able to do it. Free speech, right? Um, but when you're, for example, staying in your in your parents' home or something like that, you don't say anything that comes off the top of your head, right? You think about how it is going to affect the people around you. And I think we do that in our personal lives. And then we think suddenly we enter the public sphere and I can say any old thing. And so I think um, changing also how we think about um, what we do in the centering of our experiences is, is, is another important part of choosing what books to write, choosing what to say, um, and so on. Danielle, does your life experiences uh, have a role to play in selecting the subject for your books? Absolutely. Um, I write from a place of anger. <laughs> so I write about the things that really make me upset especially things that made me upset when I was a young person. I go back to my journals and I look for emotional kernels um, of issues that I had that I was dealing with. So my first series deals around the topic of perfection. I thought that if I was a perfect person that I wouldn't experience certain things, microaggressions, and you know, I would have more friends if I just did everything right. And um, for my series, The Bells, I wanted to know why the way that I looked when I was in middle school and high school determined how many friends I had or how people, how nice people were. And I was plagued with cystic acne and a lot of other issues that I couldn't control. And I wanted to sort of puzzle that out um, for a larger group because I really believe that writing can be a uh, therapeutic place to work out some things. And I know that other kids are angry about the same issues. So I really try to draw from an emotional truth of something that has happened to me in my life. And then I build, you know, tissue and bone and, you know, around it and a story from that. And I really wanted to also center certain kinds of experiences for my characters that I wish that I had been able to read about when I was a teenager. So that I think books are places where you can work out some mess. So, um, I usually pull from my mess, my own mess, uh, when I was a teen and uh, start from there when I build my stories. But it always comes out of something I'm grumpy about. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're getting ready now to get to the heart of the matter, 
okay. right? There are a growing number of books for children and young adults that reflect diversity, but the total, total pales in comparison to the total number of books published each year. Why is it important to have diverse books for children and young adults to read in schools, libraries, and homes? And I'm gonna to toss this one to you, Danielle. Sure, you know, I always have a lot to say about this particular topic. Why do we need it? Because yeah. if we don't have it, we're not telling the truth. Everyone loves to call, say that I censor people or that we need diverse books is infringing upon people's first amendment rights and such. But the real true censorship is the fact that certain groups of people have been systemically and systematically kept from entering publishing. And then if stories were to be written about these groups, they were written by cultural outsiders. So that when I try to publish a book that features a character like me, and there are only a few slots on the list, someone is already parked in that spot. And they're usually someone that's not from my community. They're from the dominant community. We accept certain narratives about certain groups of people and those books are published by them. And children's books are tools of cultural indoctrination that tell, especially American children, what a family is, what it, how you're to behave, what is politeness, how do we interact with our elders or police or the people around us, they code all of our values. And so when we decide that certain groups of people don't get to have representation, it sends a message. And so I believe that diversity in children's books and inclusivity is not something that should be just uh, exciting, it is mandatory. It is telling, not telling the truth about an entire country and global community with missing people. And so I just think that it's super lazy when we, uh, when we decide that it's just something that is an afterthought. Can you share some of the initiatives that, that you, you are doing at uh, We Need Diverse Books to uh, promote and advance diversity and equity and inclusion? Uh, in sure. And also in publishing, you know, within the, uh, the publishing industry itself. So We Need Diverse Books came out in 2014, viral hashtag. We got really mad. We asked people, teachers, librarians, parents to say why we need diverse books. We went viral for three or four days. Then we got to work. We looked at the publishing industry from six different vantage points, thinking about how do books go from brains to bookshelves. And we thought, where are the problems in the machine? Where is the, um, where is the issue? And we decided we needed to help authors. We needed to help publishers. And we needed to help also librarians and teachers and parents. And we needed to make sure that we got people what they needed to, to be able to create. So we created a grant called the Walter Dean Myers, named after him in his memory, both a book award so that we could award one of the best titles every year. Now we, we do several honor books and several titles so that librarians and teachers can sit up and pay attention and say, these are books that you need to have on your radar and make sure that your students have. We also have a grant in his name for up and coming writers who need money to create work. It is a luxury to be a writer and to write on spec without being paid. So we decided to have this grant. One of our first grant winners was Angie Thomas, The Hate You Give. She needed a new computer and all she wrote. Now we know how, you know, the power of being able to be able to replace your computer so that you can finish your masterpiece. We have a mentorship program pairing authors and also published um, um, up and coming authors and writers so that we can usher them through the process. We have an internship program that helps subsidize people who wanna work in publishing. And that's just a few of our programs because we believe that there are several layers to this issue. And we have to all work together. Many hands make light work. And when we come together and look at it from all the different vantage points, we can provide resources so there are no more excuses. That was a quick nutshell so that other people can talk. Well, thank you, thank you. Because uh, We Need Diverse Books obviously has uh, made an enormous difference uh, in the industry. Uh, but we built upon you. We built upon the work you were already doing and we came in because of the work and the path that you forged for us. So let's be clear. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Thank you. And, and so we obviously, obviously built on the work that happened before we, we came on the scene. It is continuous, right? Um, Adam, why is, important, why is it important for white kids uh, 
to uh, have access to uh, diverse books, books about uh, people who are different from themselves. How can they benefit from being exposed to these stories? I mean, there are so many answers and, and you touched on it with the very first um, quote from uh, Dr. Bishop. Um, and um, I talked about it when I talked about not centering the white experience, um, but I, I'm gonna do it again, Danielle. I'm sorry, I think Danielle hit on the truth when she said it's telling the truth, right? To live in a, to, to read about books that are only about white experience, which if you look at library bookshelves from 15 years ago, I mean, unfortunately, even today, but especially 15 years ago, you would think that the world was made up of pretty much only white people. Mm -hmm. And occasionally white people like to talk about people who look different, but it could have been fantasy. We're not sure because they weren't really writing the books themselves, right? So you are lying to kids. And I don't mean that in, a, in the sort of superficial sense of uh, you're just telling them something that's not true. You are implanting deep inside of a, a white child's mind uh, a false structure of the world, a false map of the world. And they will navigate that world and they will stumble. They will walk into corners. They will not know where they live and what they're doing. And we might think, oh, it's fine. Like I, I, I mostly read white books and I, I grew up okay. I grew up fine. But I've been damaging the world and other people. And I don't want to, and I don't mean to, and I'm trying to fix it. And we all do that, right? No matter our color, no matter our background, we all hurt other people sometimes. But if I go around damaging the world that I live in out of ignorance, I'm making the world worse for myself as well as for other people. So um, everybody needs diverse books um, for the, for the, if the world is going to survive. So what does it mean uh, uh, to you, Hannah, to have more diverse books? Yeah, just, uh, you know, exactly what Adam and Danielle said. I think for me personally, um, you know, I, I was there where I was being told uh, with Amina's Voice, my first uh, middle grade novel, I was being told over and over again by editors that, well, you know, we want diversity, but we're not sure if we want this kind of diversity. And, you know, this was before, I guess, in the infancy of, of We Need Diverse Books when I was trying to sell this. and. You know, I feel like it's it's been amazing to see the transformation and to see people finally accept that these books do matter and that they can sell and that they will be popular among kids and and to just see that. But you know, and, and to validate what we all knew intuitively for so long, um, but we're kind of kept away from the opportunities to publish. But for me, I mean, I think I had one of the most powerful experiences as a writer uh, last year when I was I was in Baltimore at a small school. Um, for, I guess, kids who struggled academically. And they were reading, it was a bunch of high schoolers who were reading Ominous Voice and they, had, they hadn't finished. They were on page 107 at the time when I got to chat with them. But this boy spoke up after all. He was sitting really quietly for most of the conversation. And then near the end, he spoke up and he said, uh, my family is really racist. And I hear things all the time, like Islam teaches Muslims to kill Americans. And I'm so grateful that I can read this and know the truth. And I just wanted to, I, I, I don't even know how I kept it together in that moment because I was about to start crying or hugging him or something. But to me, I was just like, you know, for all that we, there's a lot that we don't know that is going on, you know, in people's homes and, and children we know are just blank slates and empathetic and fair and, and to, you know, be able to shape their minds through through literature in a way that is going to make them better. I mean, I can't, uh, maybe it's not right to say this, but I think better people, um, you know, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's essential um, to give them different perspectives and to sort of counter some of the, the, the things that they may not even realize that they're taking in. Um, you know, in this boy's case, it was very explicit, but in, in other cases, it may not be. Um, and I think we all, you know, have so much to benefit from from reading about each other and, and learning and unlearning things. And even as adults, I recommend Kid Lit for everybody because it's easy to digest. It's great to have conversations with and and can really have conversations that you know maybe we're afraid to have in, in a bigger format. So, yeah. In fact, one of the the, the questions that I have for you guys: um, you have an opportunity to connect with uh, young readers through your books and you, you do school visits and so on. What do you find uh, that 
young people want to know when they communicate with you? What, what do they want to know? What kind of conversations or questions um, do, do they, do they uh, have for you? Yeah, for me, I'm always amazed by how many kids want to come up and speak to me privately after a visit. And I think to what Danielle was saying earlier, you know, not, to never have seen someone like me in that position, you know, that here is a Muslim woman, a brown woman, um, you know, a child of immigrants, like, you know, someone that they can relate to at some level um, and, and want to share that, you know, something about themselves. And that's always really striking. Um, but for me, I feel like a lot of times kids react uh, positively to me, even saying what, what you were saying earlier too, Danielle, that I, I never, I never even knew authors were real people. Like they were just names on books that I saw. And I, I never thought about who that person was, but I certainly didn't think that any of them were like me, that I knew for sure. So just that whole notion that you can do this. Um, you know, I, I see them respond so, so favorably to that idea that it's something that they can do if they want to. Um, and that their stories matter and that their voices matter and are needed and, you know, something that they should be proud of. Um, so that's something I feel like they respond really favorably to. And, and also the idea when I, when it's appropriate, I sometimes do speak um, or when it comes up uh, about even some of the microaggressions and some of the bullying that unfortunately Muslim kids are facing at alarming levels across the country. So to just even, you know, very positively say like, I know all of us are above that, you know, and none of you are doing anything like that, but just so you know, this is a problem some of your friends are experiencing and let's, let's be better. Um, and, and every time I just feel like they, they're just so open and receptive and um, make me you know, have hope and <laughs> hope for the future when I leave. So what kind of questions and comments, uh, Adam, do you get uh, from young people? Um, I, I get, um, uh, a lot of people want to tell me their stories, not, not, not their true stories. They have a fantasy story. They usually have a horror story that they really think I need to hear. Um, and I and wonder I, why. <laughs> what's that? I said, I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but I think that that's important, right? I think that kids really do. They process the world through not only reading stories, but telling stories. And I think that we often don't give kids enough opportunity to do that. Um, I think there's often a lot of push towards curriculum, especially towards testing in schools. And I think you really, really hurt kids. Um, I was at a community out way out on Long Island, far, far uh, Eastern Long Island. And they told me that about eight years ago, they had uh, done away with the creative writing program in their middle and high school. And they had also uh, over the last five or six years, they said experience, and this is horrible, but true, um, a raft of suicides in the school. Now, I'm not saying those things are connected, but they're connected, mm -hmm. right? When people do not have the opportunity to process their world and create and express their own voice, um, then they get stymied, they get sick. Um, and, and so, yeah, kids want to tell their stories. That's what they want to tell me. Danielle, I'm sure that uh, you uh, and Ellen and uh, your wonderful staff at We Need Diverse Books have gotten a lot of pushback from the work that you're doing. Can you share some of, some of that uh, with us, the pushback that you've gotten? Well, at one point in time, I was getting a death and rape threat every week for mm. about a year. Um, and I was doxxed by white supremacists. And I was sent, I have my PO box here in Maryland so that my mother can monitor it. And I was getting um, Holocaust pictures because I grew up near two synagogues and I was getting bananas in the mail for several months. So, and I had to have a security detail and Ellen had to make sure that her children's schools knew that she was receiving threats against their lives, the lives of her children. So it's so interesting. All I'm asking is that certain, ch that all children should be able to see themselves reflected in the pages of a book. I'm not asking anyone to give me their money. I'm not asking them to give up their land, their car, anything like that. I'm literally just asking for opportunities to be made for marginalized writers and for more books to be written. And that is the backlash that I receive is it's just hate because it's, I'm asking, I guess I'm asking for too much uh, with that. And I've just lived with sort of being under perpetually under attack since 2014 and having to deal with this kind of vitriol constantly. And the intersection of being a woman and a woman of color, both Ellen and I, Ellen O is Korean American. It just ratchets up the, the type of hate 
that we receive for making these requests and holding publishers accountable and running the data and, and making sure that, you know, every kid gets to, should go into a bookstore, a library, their classroom, and be able to see themselves reflected, see their families, see their friends, and also engage in diverse literature so that we make better humans. But you would think that I asked for people to hand over all of their money. Um, but the type of, the type of hate that I receive, I'm so numb to it now that when I get it, I'm just, sometimes it's handwritten notes. So those are the ones where I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. you have nice handwriting and you decided to send me all of that nonsense. And that's what it is. It's nonsense. And they want me to be quiet and I'm not going to be quiet about it because I owe it to the next generation of children so that their imaginations are not stifled by the types of things, the types of stories that we're giving them and feeding them, and that we're not trotting out narratives that aren't written by people from their community and propping those up as the one definitive story um, by outsiders. And so I'm not gonna be quiet about it. And so I'll take the lumps, it's fine. Yeah, you know, we, we received a lot of hate mail as well mm -hmm. uh, when we first started Just Us, and we still get them not as much as before, but. When we first started the company, I mean, we got telephone calls as well, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, my, my events were getting called. People were calling and saying that they were going to hurt me at my, my book events because of We Need Diverse Books. And I'm like, it's just children's books, friends. <laughs> <laughs> I just would, it's just children's books. <laughs> There's bunnies and trucks and cars, and I just want little brown people in these books. <laughs> That's all I'm asking for. Too much. So my wife, Cheryl, and I have edited two uh, anthologies. Um, the first one, We Rise, We Resist, We Raise Our Voices, was published in 2018. And it was published in uh, reaction to what was going on with the election and the toxic environment uh, that our, our young people were forced to uh, live in. And Hannah, you uh, had a contribution in that. Can you talk a little bit about what your piece was about in that book? Sure. Yeah, I was I was so honored that you invited me to be a part of it, and um, it's it's something that I've been I've loved seeing be embraced so widely. Um, and just I, I mentioned to Wade uh, just this past week, I was on a Zoom call and with a book club, and they said, "Can we please get this on a T-shirt?" Because they just love the logo so much. And um, it's it's my my piece focused on what I was talking about earlier, and just some of the um, the. Uh, anti-Muslim sentiment that's really been, um, I guess, prevalent since, well, I guess for the last couple decades, but really has been unleashed over the last few years. Um, and the, the, the way that children are, are, are feeling this, and I wanted to speak to them in terms of, um, you know, how they can get through this time and how they might feel when people say certain things to them. So it's sort of an open letter <laughs> to, to these children to think about um, and, and to be strong and to how, how to sort of take what people are saying and, and come back with some with the truth um, and, a, and a, another way of, of looking at it. So um, yeah, I was really, really grateful for the chance to share that. And our follow up to We Rise, We Resist, We Raise Our Voices is uh, called The Talk. Um, Conversations about race, love, and truth. Uh, and it is an anthology where writers are writing about the tough uh, subjects that parents, caregivers must have with their, their young people, their children. And Adam, you have a piece that's included called Our Inheritance. Now, initially, um, the writers we had chosen to be in this anthology were people of color. And I had heard uh, Adam uh, speak, I think it was at Bank Street about white privilege. And I was very uh, moved by what he had shared. And I felt that he had to, to be included uh, in this anthology because his perspective, his voice needed to be a part of the overall conversation. So Adam, can you just talk about your piece uh, quickly? Um, yeah. I'm really honored. I'm so honored to be part of the anthology. I've had a chance to read it and uh, it's, it's incredible. It's invaluable. Um, I hope everyone gets it, especially these days, the talk is on everyone's mind. Um, the talk that I would have with my daughter is about our inheritance. Um, so I'll very briefly, um, my Papa Jake, my great grandfather was the first Gidwitz in this country. And um, the stories I always heard about him, he was like Moses. 
leading us to a new land. And he, and he, he was a very brave and heroic guy. He came over as a, as a teenager and um, started some stores uh, in Mississippi and uh, eventually made enough money that he was able to give some to his three sons and they started a shampoo company. Um, and, and I still am able to benefit from the profits of that shampoo company. It's how I could afford to teach at that school that didn't pay me very much. So Papa Jake was always this big figure in my head. And then um, some years ago, a couple of years ago, um, I discovered his memoir. We knew we knew we had it and I never had actually read it. And finally somebody gave it to me and I read it. And I found out that the way Papa Jake made his money um, was not just through little dry goods stores in Mississippi. Um, it was through credit uh, for sharecroppers, which ultimately became land on which sharecroppers lived. Um, and, uh, this is actually, we just discovered Danielle, the exact same area where Danielle's family mm -hmm. uh, came, comes from. And I heard stories about him evicting, you know, 26 families from, from some land and bragging about four still being there, uh, when he was writing that memoir 30 or 40 years later. Um, and that's how he got enough money that they could start a shampoo company that allowed me to write my books. Uh, it was through sharecropping, through profiting off of, what was essentially slavery updated instead of the law, it was now debt. And so it was amazing to me how, you know, I'm, I'm Jewish and we also have a history of persecution and we tell stories about persecution. And yet, even as a persecuted minority, we are white. And I, my family was able to come to this country and tap into the history, the legacy, the reality, the current existence of slavery and of racism and profit from it kind of like my family moving into that neighborhood and saying no Jews or blacks allowed. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's the story that I tell, but um, you should get the, the anthology, the talk pre-order now, if that's possible, because um, there are a lot better stories than mine in, in that anthology. Well, I, the release date I think is August the 11th. Danielle, you're going to be getting a letter because we're working on another one. So <laughs> I mean, I was I was begging. I know Ms. Cheryl <laughs> begging to be included. So I'm ready when you are. Okay. Anything uh, I think for we're, you? We're at the end, because this conversation has gone longer than uh, I think we were time we were allotted, but it's been interesting. But my last question uh, for you is that if you can go back in time and speak to that young boy or girl growing up, your younger self. What would you share with him or her that would make better prepare you to be a writer today? Uh, you want to take a shot at it, Hannah? Sure. Um, something I tell kids a lot is that uh, you're not born a good writer and that um, you don't have to find writing easy to be a writer and that that's what a, a a common perception I think kids have that you're a good writer if it's something that comes naturally to you or that you know you have lots of words that you can you can spell out of onto a page and and if you know you struggle with it that it's somehow not for you um, and so that's something I wish I understood when I was younger that my process like I agonize over first drafts and I it doesn't flow the way I expect you know in my mind I had imagined writers to just you know sit and type and until they had the writer's block, it was all just coming out of them. And for me, it's painful. And I, I think I'm more of a natural editor, um, but just to explain to kids that, that that's okay. Um, and if, and if it's not something that comes easy to you, you can, you can practice and, and get there. And it's, it's a skill that is learned. So I think that's what I would share. Adam. Uh, well, I always do tell kids to spend as much time as you possibly can imagining. Um, if you want big muscles, you do push-ups. If you want a big creative brain, you imagine because push-ups is like, uh, uh, imagination is like push-ups for your brain. But I wouldn't have needed to tell myself that because that's what I did all the time as a kid. <laughs> so what I think I would tell myself as a kid would be to not be afraid to make friends with people who appear different from you because I think I was afraid. Not, yeah, for a million reasons. And then once you do make that friend or those friends, um, I would uh, quote my friend Joseph Bruchak, a brilliant writer, Native American author, um, who told me, people often forget that we have two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we <laughs> speak. So go make those different friends and then listen. 
My and grandmother you, used to say that too. Did she? <laughs> yeah. She would say, you have one mouth, but you use it a lot. You have two ears and you don't use it enough. Use those two enough. That's a good um, thing. So that, like. <laughs> I would say two things. I would tell myself, my younger self, that everything about my family and where I come from and all of those things is magic and it is gold and it will fuel my stories and that I don't have to be ashamed just because I was the fly in the milk and the only brown kid that there is nothing wrong with me and being me is most important and don't try to be like that, like anyone else. Um, and I think that would make me help, help me find my narrative voice and the types of stories that I wanted to tell earlier. And maybe I would have been a writer um, earlier in life. And I think what I would tell kids today is that you might not like to write, but there are other ways to be a storyteller. You can write for TV, you can write, writing rap is poetry, writing music, you can write video games, you can write TV shows and films and anime, that there is, that you are, a not, everyone is a storyteller. And that if you don't tell your story, someone else will. So you need to do it and find your medium and find your way to translate it. And that's what I tell them at every single every single thing, every single school visit I do. Well, listen, thank you all for the conversation. This has been awesome. So I'm going to kick it back now to Mayor Ashman. Are you there? I'm here. And uh, I agree, this has been awesome. It, I realize it has gone on a little bit uh, longer, but we, we have some questions from the audience I wanted, I wanted to get to. Um, I do want to note for the record that when we were putting together this panel, uh, we invited you guys because uh, you're incredible, awesome authors and doing great work, not necessarily because of the Maryland connections, but that's a happy coincidence. And uh, Danielle, of course, gets a little bit of extra points for being from Gaithersburg. Um, so uh, I mentioned in the intro that we turn to books um, in, in when, when we're sort of at, at a loss. Um, and that I was looking at the New York Times bestseller nonfiction list this weekend. Um, it lists 15 books. 12 of the 15, 12 of the 15 on the New York Times bestseller list right now are books that, that attempt to uh, tackle, help people get their arms around uh, race and racism and race relations in this country. Um, so people are obviously turning to books at this, at this point in time. Um, and, and for the grownups, because I'm sure our audience here is, is uh, consists of grownups, my question to you guys is, are there some books that you wish that grownups were reading? Uh, maybe something in, that you've read um, in your life, uh, not necessarily a children's book, and, uh, it, although it could be, uh, that has really changed the way that, that you see the world. Uh, I'm reading a book right now. Uh, well, I was reading it for a project and I've picked it up again. Um, actually, my wife stole it from me for recently. This is a book that I, I just I have on the, on the shelf that I wanted to share with people. Um, it is called A Covenant with Color, Race and Social Power in Brooklyn. It is an academically published book. It came out in, in uh, the year uh, 2000. Um, so it's, it's um, I guess, it's old now. Um, but it is um, a lot of what uh, Dr. Ibrahim Kendi traces in Stamp from the Beginning is uh, written about here in um, a micro history of Brooklyn. Now, I know it was about Maryland, and I'm sorry, everybody. But when you get into the, the micro history of what it looks like in this one little corner of Long Island to define um, uh, race for the sake of profit, which is where it comes from, right? There's a great quote in the beginning of the book. Is, is, is the question is, did prejudice lead to inequality? You know, in the book, it seems like inequality led to prejudice, that to justify the inequality, racism was created and invented. And to see the micro histories of that um, in this book, Covenant with Color by Craig Stephen Wilder, a professor at um, MIT, an um, African-American man. Um, great book. So highly recommend that one. Matt, Jude, I, I think I sent a, um, uh, some links to, uh, to uh, Carolyn earlier today. So I don't know if those links, and they have a suggested uh, reading lists. Uh, so I don't know if- We did receive those. And actually for our viewers, they are in the description of this program on YouTube. So please take a look at that list. Okay. Uh, Danielle, did you have any others that you wanted to add? 
Sure. I mean, you can start with the New York Times bestseller list. It gives you sort of your reading list, uh, starting with Stamped from the Beginning, both the young adult, young adult version written by Jason Reynolds, but also the adult one by Ibram Kendi. But also I would find space for fun stories that feature kids of color and Black children particularly, because a lot of those are academic. And academic is great, but I also want you to see living you know, children, fictional children that are created by Black content creators that are full of joy, like Renee Watson's book, uh, Ways to Make Sunshine, which is a Black girl who lives in the neighborhood that Ramona Quimby grew up in, because that's where Renee Watson is from. Or Tristan Strong punches a hole in the sky. It's sort of, it's part of the Rick Rorden Presents line. And it's about a Black boy who has to save the day. And I want you to fill yourself, or Felix in Love by Casey Callender about a trans boy who falls in love for the first time. And I want you to fill your well also with love and adventure and magic and mischief or look both ways by Jason Reynolds, which is just about what happens after school between kids leaving school and getting home. And so I fear at times when we give these book lists that we leave out the soft parts, the family parts, the love parts, um, and we only focus on the pain. And we right. need the pain to talk about the pain, but we also need to talk about the love yep. as well. Love that. How about you, Hannah? Yeah, I was, uh, many of those books are ones I would recommend, but one, another way to perhaps approach it would be to form a book club, you know, with either family members or friends and maybe, maybe tackle different aspects. So have a definitely like a joy book and a, a slice of life, you know, fun to read summer adventure, maybe. Um, and maybe have a memoir and a history book or you know how to be an anti-racist book and 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 then this is what i'm going to force my family to do <laughs> my two teen boys and, I'm, and i was like we're all going to read a different book and then it's like we've all then we'll report back what we read and it's, it's sort of a different take on a book club but um i think it's great to have that that type of variety and there's so many great lists out there to, to choose from and i think it's important uh what hannah just said it's important to engage in discussions about the books you know and not, you know, because sometimes, you know, what we do, we'll read a book and we'll, it's a solo kind of experience. But at this point, at this inflection point, I think where we are, it's important to engage in discussions with other people about what you've read. Totally agree. I'm sorry, I have to, I have to be very rude right now. I am supposed to be hosting another meeting about structural change and I'm the host. And if I don't go, it's it, then it's gonna fall. So you guys know more than I do about all of these subjects. I would just like to say thank you so much um, to the Gaithersburg Festival, um, to Hannah, to Danielle, and especially to Wade Hudson for all the work that you do and you have done in this incredible conversation. I'm, I'm very grateful to have been a part of it. Thank you, Adam. Sorry, thank you, Adam. I'm very embarrassed, but. I think we're near the end, Thank right, you. Mel? We we just have a couple questions I want to get to from from the the um, the audience. If you guys, if you have to go, I would totally understand. Um, and, and maybe you know each one, one person could answer each one. This one comes from Adrian. Uh, the question is, how can we as kid lit writers move beyond diversity toward intersectionality? Uh, black and and uh, people of uh, POC kids can be LGBT. Q plus, uh, disabled, autistic, et cetera. How can we make everyone feel seen without being heavy handed? Just raise your hand if you want to take a, a stab at that. Hannah, you want to do that one? <laughs> I'll, ta I'll take the next one, I promise. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, this might be overly simplistic, but I would say just, just write the story you want to write. Um, and, you know, with thankfully things are moving in a direction where people do want that variety. They are, the publishing industry is slowly opening up and we do see a willingness to explore and include different voices. So I don't think you need to be heavy handed. I think if you're just telling an authentic story where you're not trying too hard to, you know, teach or to show these various identities, you know, and just, and write a, a good story, hopefully it'll find a home. I, you know, I hope that doesn't too, too basic, but that's what I believe. Okay, um, we'll go on to the next one just for time reasons. Uh, this comes from Katura. Uh, what's the biggest thing you learned about yourself from writing for young people? Oh my goodness, she would ask a question like this straight to the heart and I've got to answer it. Um, I think the biggest thing that I've learned um, about myself from writing these books is that I feel like I am channeling my 16 year old self and my 16 year old self was really invested in 
needing to figure out sort of the messy experience of adolescence when you're trying to figure out, is this the planet that I belong on? Is this the world that as it is? And I think that I needed to figure out and I try to strive to write teenagers as they are and not how I want them to be. And I learned that I was a very complicated and grumpy and sort of, you know, acerbic teen and I needed a space to work those things out. And I feel like I hope that in my books, I provide a safe space for other teenagers who are trying to figure out like, what is this mess that the adults have done? What am I going to do about it? How do I feel about it? Um, I learned that I needed to create a space like that for myself as a writer. And hopefully I'm creating space for a teen to also explore some of those uncomfortable thoughts and feelings. Um, I'm cheating on my own rule here. Hannah, did, did you want to take a, a stab at that or pass it off to the next question? Um, we can go on, yeah. Okay, one, there's only one more question. This is the last one. Um, and, you know, Wade, maybe this one, this one's for you. Can you talk about the importance of positive adult male characters of color in children's literature? Well, that's, that's really, really important. Um, when I was growing up, um, there were black male role models for me. Um, and they were really loving and caring, protective and, and that kind of thing. But um, they were mostly uh, laborers. So when I was growing up, I was, I, this writer was like fighting to get out. So I used to sit on my front porch and, and write poems and short stories, but there was no one I could communicate with, you know, who understood what this little black boy was going through uh, as he was writing. And my father, um, again, he was caring, supportive, uh, but he did not understand, you know, this little black boy needing to write and to express himself. Um, so when I went to college, it wasn't until I went to college actually that I was around uh, male role models who could share with, with, with me, uh, how important writing was and that I could become a writer. So I'm saying I ought to say this, that it's so important for boys to have a variety of role models around them. We don't know what we're gonna grow up to become. Uh, for example, I have a, ne a nephew uh, who's a, a great musician. You know, his father's a musician. So he was able to uh, carve a career out in the mu music industry because his father was an excellent role model for him. And so many young black boys don't have role models. So having a, an appropriate role model is just so crucial to the development uh, of, uh, of uh, b b growing into adulthood as, as, a, as a man. Thank you and, so much. And, and books can, books can also uh, be a vehicle uh, as well. You know, I'm remembering uh, reading Black Boy when I was uh, a freshman in college uh, by Richard Wright and how that just opened up a world for me and I identified with Richard Wright as a writer. So he became a role model for me. I, I didn't know him personally, but because he was a success, successful writer, he was a role model for me. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. So. Look, at, at a, a difficult time like this, I feel like the best sort of gifts we can possibly give to our communities are a constructive voice, a valuable perspective, the tools to foster better understanding and a hopeful vision for, for what we can achieve and who we can be. Um, tonight, by joining us and taking part in this conversation, you guys have embodied that gift. Um, and on behalf of our city, our book festival and all of our viewers, I wanna offer a profound thank you to Danielle Clayton, Adam Gidwitz, Henna Khan, and our moderator, Wade Hudson. Um, you guys mentioned a, a few times, you mentioned um, Walter Dean Myers in this conversation. We had the distinct honor of hosting uh, Mr. Myers about six years ago at our festival. Mm -hmm. um, and may he rest in peace. I'm sure he would have enjoyed this conversation very much. Yeah. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, the David McKell Blair Fa Family Foundation, Downtown Crown, RPAI, and Montgomery College. To our viewing audience, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us tonight. 
I hope you found the program to be valuable and maybe even share this video with friends and neighbors. Um, it will live here on our YouTube channel. Um, we encourage you to support our authors by purchasing their books from our partner, Independent Bookstore Politics and Prose. For your convenience, there are links in the description box below, as well as the books that uh, Wade Hudson suggested for us. Uh, please also take a look around our YouTube channel for lots of engaging content for both kids and adults. Uh, if you enjoyed this program, please make sure you click on the like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, and remember to follow the Gaithersburg Book Festival on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time, my fellow people of the book,